Coming up on Omnivore, the return of food innovation at South by Southwest, five key components of a clean label strategy, and a dietitian's perspective on the FDA's new healthy label guidelines. It's all ahead on episode 11 of Omnivore, from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's Concierge Membership Service. Save time, money, and people power with the Concierge Membership. Find out more at ift.org slash concierge membership. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology. I'm Bill McDowell. The recent South by Southwest conference in March welcomed the post-pandemic return of a food innovation track with 22 panel sessions over three days on topics such as plant-based food trends, carbon-neutral beef, food waste, agritech innovators, and more. Food Technologies' Kelly Hensel was there to take it all in and recently sat down with associate editor Emily Little to share her observations. So Kelly, you just went to South by Southwest. How was it to be back? Well, it's good to be back. It was nice to be there enjoying the nice Austin weather. Um, it was it was a great conference. So yeah, it was a joy. So a lot of people when they think South by Southwest, they think film festival or music festival, but that's not why you were there. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about why you did attend? Yeah, well, you're right. It is a big music and film festival. And that wasn't why I was there, although I did get to see some interesting side activities going on. But um, I was there. They also have a huge conference every year that's a part of it. And there's tons of different tracks that go on at the same time. And one of the tracks this year was focused on food. And it was a really three days of great panel sessions with tons of change makers, governmental organizations, um, startup companies, really making a difference in the in the space. It was really, really focused on the future of food, um, you know, ways in which policies and technologies can all be used to kind of make the food system more sustainable equitable, um, nutritious for, for all. When you think back on your time at South by Southwest, what were some of the main topics that rose to the surface? Yeah, so protein was at the center of a lot of these panels. And, and they kind of ranged from everything from we heard about cell-based meat, uh, air fermentation cultivation, aquaculture, cricket farming, of course, had to be there. And then we also heard um, more traditional proteins like cattle farming um, and, and fishing. That's interesting that they they span such a big range because I feel like when we hear about, you know, protein innovation, your mind immediately goes to plant based. So I like that they also included those cattle farmers. Yeah, you know, it was a really interesting kind of dichotomy because they, for example, one of the panels was called Space Age Science Fighting Global Hunger. And it, it you know, it had Lisa Dyson from Air Protein on there who's doing that cool creating protein from air, water, and energy. I don't even know how it works, but <laughs> she's doing amazing things. And you had Kobe Nahamas, who was from Believer Meats. And he, you know, he was there. They just opened that huge uh, facility in North Carolina to to really amp up and and make cultured meat like scalable. Mm -hmm. So um, you had those those great, really innovative technologies on one panel. And then you had this other session was called carbon neutral beef. Is it too good to be true? Uh, and and the the rancher on there, her name's Corey Carmen. She owns Carmen Ranch, but it's actually kind of a collective of all of these ranchers on the on the north uh, west coast in Oregon. And what they're doing is they're really building uh, ways in which they can do cattle farming, cattle ranching, but do it better and do it better for the soil and ways to se sequester the carbon and ways to cut methane emissions. So they're actually working with uh, Alexei um, from Symbrosia, who, we, who we've covered in Food Technology Magazine before, who have developed this cattle feed that uses seaweed that cuts methane emissions, you know? So they're doing a pilot program together. It's really cool. Um, and, and Carmen Ranch, actually, they are the first beef brand in the country that just earned the uh, Regenified um, verification, which is a, a standard that's, yeah, pretty new, but it's, it, you know, basically they have to 
prove that through soil tests and all of these other various methods that they're doing good for the earth while they're, you know, obviously participating in, in some more traditional farming. So um, it, it just the range of um, solutions, I guess, from high tech to low tech, uh, they were all present at the the conference, which really drove home to me that there's not one solution that's better. All solutions are on the table and all solutions need to be looked at. It's all about the tiny changes and the big changes. You mentioned that they talked a little bit about food security in terms of climate change. Can you talk about some of those discussions? Yeah, yeah. There was um, a whole panel with I, which I found fascinating, uh, called "Tackling Food Insecurity with NASA Satellite Data." So um, we probably all, I mean, we all realize that NASA does more than just send um, space shuttles to the moon and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they do tons of work. And and in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, they launched um, this very first Landsat satellite, which was specifically targeted at looking at um, agricultural monitoring applications. So we actually now have 24 satellites that are up in space looking back at the earth. And amazingly, all of this data that they are recording is free and open access. So they talked a lot, this panel talked a lot about how they're, I think the, the, the challenge still remains is how you're using this data to make um, changes. So, and, you know, they're they're trying to find partnerships basically with with people out there that are looking to take this data, make it accessible, make it easy for, you know, like farmers on the ground to to access and to get these key takeaways from. They can look at everything from precipitation to snow melt to crop stress. It's pretty amazing what they oh, can wow. see from space. Yeah. And and it's global. So, you know, even when the the whole Ukraine war started, they were able to help kind of even get aid to where people needed it by seeing, hey, are the grain silos in this area of the country, are they damaged? Have they been bombed? Oh, wow. What not? And then they're able to work with like aid organizations to say, hey, these people, they might need more help in this area versus another area. It's pretty impressive um, what you can do once this action, this data is turned into actionable insights. So I'm sensing a theme here, Kelly, of collaboration. So yeah. many different organizations that you might not think of, but they're working together to solve this problem. Yes, collaborate. Yeah, I think collaborate. The word collaboration came up in probably every single panel I was, <laughs> I was on, and and it can't be understated. I mean, obviously, this is a global problem that needs you know many people. A global solution. You have to be tons of different kinds of people at the table. Whether it's NASA, whether it's you know uh, startups like Believer Meats, whether it's uh, World Food Program, you need you need everybody um, to have a seat at the table. So yeah, collaboration was kind of a common theme. Was there anything left off the table? You think in some of these discussions? Yeah, you know. I was, I guess, surprised. Some some of the sessions, some of the panelists kind of mentioned the farm bill, which is obviously huge, uh, a huge topic of discussion this year in particular because it's going to set the, you know, the the uh, policies for the next five years in terms of agriculture, commodities, and all sorts of implications to that. But uh, some of the panelists mentioned the farm bill, and funny enough, two of the panels I was uh, attending, they they mentioned at the very end, the, like the last question of the panel was, "So what about this farm bill?" And I and I thought to myself, well, they probably should have allowed a little bit more time to discuss that. And, and some of the panelists agreed. They were like, "Well, that's kind of a huge a huge deal." There was a you know a feeling that probably the the crops and the commodities that are being subsidized by farm bills in the past may not be exactly where we should be spending our subsidies. Um, and maybe we need to talk more about diversifying our crops as opposed to, you know, this monocrop agricultural practices, which we've been involved in for so long. So th I think that there could have been a lot more discussion around that, around the farm bill policies and what could change and what could or what needs to change in order to make some of these uh, solutions that we've been talking about the entire conference, you know, accessible and actually happen. Kelly Hensel is the Deputy Managing Editor of Food Technology. 
You can read more of Kelly's coverage from South by Southwest in a series of digital exclusive articles on IFT.org. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. IFT's concierge membership service is like hiring an on-call staffer to help your innovation, R&D, and product development teams move faster. Tap into your consultant budget to get what you need now. From curated research to expert connections, the concierge is in. Get access to an IFT technical concierge today at ift.org slash concierge membership. That's ift.org slash concierge membership. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. The market for clean label ingredients is projected to reach $64 billion by 2026, according to a report by Allied Market Research. The demand for clean label impacts an array of products, including seasoning mixes, bouillons, wet and dry pasta sauces, prepackaged ready made meals, and other monospace mixes. But the definition of what clean label actually means is a moving target, sometimes overlapping in consumers' minds with natural, organic, and products free from preservatives and additives. Without a fixed definition, tactics for developing clean label seasoning and meal mixes can be challenging. Food Technology Science and Technology Editor Julie Larson Brisher spoke with Unilever Senior Scientist Naval Jehun to get her advice on five essential elements necessary to develop a clean label strategy for seasonings. Hi, Neville. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Hi, Julie. The pleasure is all mine. Oh my gosh. Well, let's dive right in then. Uh, You had a recent article in Food Technology where you describe how to develop a clean labeling strategy. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about why it's important for food companies to have that clean label strategy in general. Well, actually, the story always starts with the consumer. Consumer is on the center, let's say. Uh, Well, the increasing desire from consumers for clean labeling establishes a clear need for business, suppliers, and governments to define and address these demands across the entire process of seasoning, sourcing, testing, manufacturing, and selling. Um, We know that consumers have certain habits regarding with some substances, such as we know that they are taking a negative impact on the food coloring, added flavors, or some preservatives. So in the last time, especially starting with the pandemic, let's say, uh, the health concern started to rise up. So uh, the, the now the consumer demands more flavor profile, but in a healthy way. Clean labeling not only give the, uh, gives the food products uh, as a natural or healthy appearances, but also truly and systematically ensures the product delivers flavor, visuals, textures, aroma uh, with the consumer desires. And also it enhances the product sales. So we can think about it. It's a win-win scenario for both consumers and the business part, which creates also the competition in the market and improves the health for consumers alongside sustainability and health standards in the market. Right. Well, you know, in the article, I really liked how you outlined five simple steps for developing a clean labeling strategy. And you use the food seasonings category to illustrate your points. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about those steps, um, a couple of them. Uh, The first one that you shared was consider supply chain sourcing and sustainability to ensure 100% natural ingredients. Can you talk a little bit about this step, especially in the age, as you just mentioned, of COVID-19 related supply chain disruptions? Uh, We can think about that supply chain is in the heart of the whole process. In one side, we have the consumers. In one side, we have the business. And the supply chain becomes a bridge between the consumers and the business. So strategically, it is very important, we can say that. But also, we know that we have many bottlenecks in the supply chain part. 
which is coming from the source of sustainability or uh, changing environment which economical or with the pandemic. So the supply chain presents particular challenges for clean label products, especially amid recent issues due to COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical unrest. Uh, consumer demands for clean label products uh, encapsulate a desire for health food options, but also organic and the sustainable options that prioritize environmental businesses. Uh, for business, this means understanding the supplier sourcing and the processing, in addition to the resulting product qualities. Uh, consumer demands often uh, affect marketing first, product next, and the supplier last. But suppliers can improve their supply and production to also be clean across quality and the conditions. Well, you know, there's a lot of challenges and opportunities out there, despite all of the disruption that we've seen. But there was another step that I found really interesting that you talked about in the article, and it had to do with communicating clean label attributes through product packaging. I hadn't really thought about that. So how does packaging play a role in clean labeling strategy? Yeah, that, that's a good question because we know that in a current live situation, the consumers don't have time. They don't have to, time to search the product. They don't have time to read the product. They don't have time to understand what is really this product uh, provides for us in terms of the nutritional values, in terms of the clean label. And also we know that the product, the consumer does not make any differentiation. What is the clean label? What is the organic? What is the natural? So it, it, within this case, business has a big responsibility to show the consumers that in a basic and a simple way that this product is simple, this product has less less uh, artificial ingredients and this product provides you this kind of thing. So this becomes very important in terms of the packaging because when we are buying some product, firstly, a visual comes. It's a selling story, you know. Firstly, we are attracted to one visual and after that we are buying. After that, we are tasting that food. We are taking uh, look, looking for the texture. We are smelling it or we are just observing the products. Most consumers, however, don't have time to and energy to research every product before they buy it. This means when shopping on package, ingredient information sources are more influential than online other sources, marketing or word of mouth. It is paramount for manufacturers of clean label products to clearly state what makes their product clean and list ingredients accordingly such as identifying the main ingredients on the front page packaging alongside true ingredient list and nutrition facts on the bags is crucial. While image or su suggested recipes that uh, accurately reflect the product play a role in catching the consumer eyes, consumer respond well to recognizable and fewer ingredients. If the product addresses this goal, the package is a key player in communicating that to buyers. Right. And, you know, that that reminds me, like, from a product development perspective, there's got to be still uh, big challenges, right, facing companies who are trying to produce those clean label products and communicate that their products have clean label ingredients like seasonings. Yep. Uh, I think because challenge is currently from the also what I see, what I observe also during my experience in the projects is the cost for the business perspective. From the consumer perspective, the challenge is to make the clear definition for the clean label. Really, what is clean label and what provides? We can manage the consumer parts as a business. It was okay. But from the business perspective, the business wants to reach out to more consumers to provide them more healthy products with a clean, more superior flavor profile. But it is not easy to find all the sustainable source. So sustainable to find a sustainable source is not easy because we have a, like, and you can think about the demand 
and we are not able to reach always the best quality of the ingredients. This is first. And the second thing is that we need to, business needs to provide all the organization accordingly these uh, challenges, which means that cost, again, in terms of technology, in terms of process, in terms of recipe, let's say. So these are common uh, issues regarding with especially budgetary but also as business we know that if the business uh, overcome these challenges they can reach out to more consumers so again it becomes a win-to-win situation but at least at the beginning business needs to make this communication alongside between the supplier till to the end point so when incorporating clean label goals in the product development it's essential to understand and create a strategy that acknowledges and accounts for these obstacles Oh, wow. That's, that's a really good point. Um, you know, thanks. Thanks again, Neville, for sharing your insights with our omnivore listeners today. And, you know, all this talk about seasonings has me thinking about what I'm going to use in my fish taco recipe tonight. Uh, thanks to you firstly. And I have a great comment for this one. Just, I was in Mexico city last week. And in fish taco, I tried the chipotle dressing sauce. So it's a perfect match. If you have a closed market or something, or maybe in your home, you can try the chipotle sauce. It's a perfect match for fish taco. Enjoy. Oh, oh man, I'm on it. Thanks, Neville. Neval Jehun is a senior scientist and technical project leader for Unilever's Research and Development Center based in the North America Nutrition Business Unit. She is responsible for product development in the nutrition portfolio and strategic operations for the innovation funnel. More about Naval's five steps for developing a clean label strategy for seasonings can be found in the May issue of Food Technology. Last September, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration unveiled a long-awaited update to its healthy label guidelines for food products. In a recent dialogue essay for food technology, dietitian Lynn Stewart argues that the FDA overlooked a critical ingredient in the new rules that could put a serious dent in their effectiveness. I caught up with Lynn to explain her position and why her discovery of the omission came from an unexpected ally. Explain briefly your overall philosophy on food because you seem to mostly reject really rigid notions of good food versus bad food and focus on a more holistic approach. Being a dietitian is a second career for me. Before I went back to school, I did my own sort of self-study culinary tour. So I spent six months working a farm in British Columbia. I did a couple of years private cooking in Paris. I ate down one side of Italy and back up again. So when I walked into my first nutrition class, I was, you know, pretty food literate at that point. I love food. I love to eat. And there's an analytic part of me, too. I love to run the numbers, which probably distinguishes me from most of the dietitians out there. Because dietitians that like to run the numbers, like I have no way of knowing if they also like food but they tend to go the food science route or they tend to get into labeling as a dietitian. Dietitians who want to do counseling, they tend, in my personal opinion, maybe not to look with such scrupulous care that I do with the numbers, how they line up, because it's a different kind of application. I like to do both at the same time, which is why I sit in the middle and I get beat up by both sides. One of the things that you said in the essay, though, is it's not any single item you eat. It's how you eat over the course of an entire day. And for that, I have to thank my professional society, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, wrote a position paper in 2013, what is healthy. Um, I stand by that. It's It's one of the best descriptions, in my opinion, of what constitutes a definition of healthy. And this I'm going to read. The total diet 
or overall pattern of food is the most important focus of healthy eating. And that's how I always approach my counseling sessions. And I've counseled at all levels, you know, from financial service professionals, you know, from New York City to Medicaid recipients. But I never told people what to eat. I, I got a sense through dialogue how they were approaching food. And then I could help them move towards, say, a little closer to a healthy eating pattern. It was a luxury. I didn't have to follow the rules. I didn't even have to know the rules <laughs> the way I did for, um, you know, for running the numbers. But then that shifted when you went from one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling and started working with cookbook publishers, with food service clients. How did that change the way that you sort of approached your, your work? Well, I like to think of the analogy of, of binary rulemaking. When you come to a stoplight, everybody stops. That's, you, don't, you don't use your judgment or your discretion or look. Most people don't look for nuance. It's binary and it's for public safety and that's the right way to do it. My personal opinion, food is much too complex for those kinds of simplistic rules. So uh, just as an example, um, I remember last year I was, I do menu analysis, cycle menus. You know, they have four weeks of menus and they repeat over and over and over again. So uh, this is a, a, a food service institution that uses the 2,300 milligrams of sodium as the daily cutoff point. No more, period, end of story. We had to, at least for the purposes of doing the analysis, add no salt to the vegetables because in this particular institution, processed food just has more salt than people use when they home cook. Between that, milk has sodium in it. Milk on the tray three times a day, it adds up. There was no way I could guarantee they wouldn't go over 2,300 milligrams without doing every single day. And that was ridiculous. So you wrote that you were pretty excited when this new FDA update was published. So what were what was your initial impression? And then what changed as you began reviewing the comments over the next five months? Well, I was really pleasantly surprised because the FDA acknowledged that food counts. In 1994, which is when I started my nutrition studies, healthy was defined exclusively by its nutrients. Food was not an issue. So I thought that was really good. I mean, a lot of commentators have said, wow, FDA, it's about time. Good job. <laughs> um, and I think that is very positive. I was disappointed uh, as I continued to read the document and as I continued to read the comments, when I realized that um, the, th the three nutrients of concern, which have now been reduced to sodium saturated fat, fat and added sugar, were set at what I would consider to be very low thresholds. And what that really means is that healthy equals low fat, low salt, low sugar. I mean, I would be much happier with the FDA if they said this product is low fat, low salt, low sugar. But what they've done is they've taken a good word like healthy and applied it in the same old nutrient context. And I have a problem with that. You, you noted that as the, uh, as the comments were coming in, the first one that even mentioned the the the, the whole idea of palatability <laughs> was from uh, consumer packaged goods yes. arena. How much did that surprise you to all of a sudden find yourself at least partially in agreement with them? Mind you, I am fully in agreement with them. I don't agree on much else they do, but I am fully... I was so surprised. I, I mean, I did. I touched every single comment. I went back and scanned the comments 
just to be sure somebody didn't mention palatability or palatable because I didn't want to start saying that if if it was I who missed it. But no, they they were the only people. I mean, essentially, they they were the only people that acknowledged that how a food tastes should be a component of healthy. I so mean, let's drill into that. Mary, let's huh? let's drill in. Let's drill into that. Let's <laughs> let's talk about why palatability is important because, as you say, it's not addressed in the rules. But you also say that it's, a, it's not something that a lot of dietitians talk much about. So, so why is that, and and why are they? What 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 are we missing here? Well, I've been trying to figure that out ever since I got my RDN. It never occurred to me that taste wasn't a component of what makes food healthy. But to my great surprise, not only did most of my fellow students not cook. They weren't really interested in cooking or what I would consider to be food. And it's not all dietitians. I have some wonderful colleagues who are out there saying, yes, food should taste good. Yes, you can eat healthy and you can eat food that's tasty. You know, taste and deliciousness and healthy don't have to be contrary. Well, t- talk a little bit more about why it's important though, in, in terms of making guidelines like this a success? What's, what's, what's the impact on consumers? What's the impact on people adopting uh, and embracing these things if that component is left out of the discussion? I see two problems. I mean, Americans... Um, eat too much fat, too much salt, too much sugar. I don't think that's really an argument. So it's my opinion that Americans could benefit from a few good guidelines. Um, You know, survey after survey after survey says Americans are confused about what to eat. My first problem with how the FDA is defined healthy is that the people who really could benefit from a few good rules are going to ignore what they say. Because essentially, the FDA is going to say everything you like to eat isn't good for you. And the people who like to eat that way is going to say, so why should I pay attention to you? And that's, that's not helpful. The second problem I have with it is actually, well, they're both pretty serious, but this is a different kind of serious Reinforcing a message that food is the means of pursuing wellness, devoid of pleasure or society or cultural influences, leads directly to disordered eating patterns in any person who's susceptible. So what's your bottom line on all of this? Do you think in its current form that the new rules will ultimately facilitate healthier eating habits? Oh, it's still a work in progress. Actually, Darius Mosafarian, who is my current food hero, it's a much better protocol than what we had in 1994, but we ain't done yet. Lynn Stewart is a registered dietitian, recipe analyst, and food and nutrition consultant. Her essay on the missing ingredient in FDA's proposed rule appears in the May issue of Food Technology. Want to weigh in on Lynn's comments? IFT members can join the discussion by visiting ift.connectedcommunity.org. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT's Concierge Membership. Accelerate your product development and innovate faster with a Concierge Membership. Find out more at ift.org slash concierge membership. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, 
Check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of IFT.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at IFT.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.